In previous videos, you'll learn how to set up a full stack Mern project from scratch, how to add pagination, search, authentication using email and Google, and much more. Today, we're going to add a new essential feature, and that is comments. If you haven't watched the first four parts, they're going to be linked in the description. Make sure to watch them first and then come back. This video is special because it can also be watched as a standalone video that teaches you functionality needed for implementing comments. However, I'd still strongly encourage you to watch the first four parts because then you'll have a much stronger understanding of the project we're building. As I mentioned before, I initially planned on putting this as a paid course, but I later decided to release it completely free for you guys here on YouTube. So to support this video, leave a like, comment and subscribe. It shouldn't take more than a few seconds and I really appreciate it. On another note, some of you in the comments requested me to add some extra features to this app. Things like a live chat feature or even the entire Google Maps functionality where each memory is displayed on a world map. If you'd like me to create a sixth part of this series where I add one of the features you requested, make sure to like, comment and subscribe. If this video reaches 5000 likes, we're recording part six. With that said, let's do a short demo and then let's jump straight into the project. So the new feature we're adding are comments. Let's visit a single memory page. As you can see, now here is an entire comment section where you can view and write comments. JS Mastery and John already left some comments. Let's add a few more. Hello there. Let's write it. There we go, it fit on the screen. But if we add one more, this is awesome. There we go. And if you keep adding more comments like this, you're going to see that it actually scrolls to the bottom. So we're also going to implement the scrolling functionality. To implement comments, we're going to work with React and Redux on the front end. The data coming from the front end will be sent to the back end to be stored to the MongoDB database. Essentially, we're going to use everything that you need to know to build a full stack Mern application. Before we dive right in, I'd like to quickly introduce you to BrainFM. I've been personally using their software for quite some time now. They create music that improves your focus while coding. And it's not just a gimmick, it's actually backed by science. The link is going to be down in the description, feel free to try it out, it's completely free. If you do decide to upgrade to a pro plan, I've also prepared a discount code for you. With that said, let's jump straight into the video. To be sure we are on the same page when starting the project, you can click the GitHub link down in the description and that's going to lead you to this page. Of course, if you'd like to learn the Mern stack fully, I'd strongly suggest you to start with the first video in the series. That way, you'll learn everything you need to know and you'll also learn how to deploy it. The link is going to be down in the description. So let's go to part four. Let's click this green code button and let's download it as a zip. Once the project is downloaded, you can drag and drop it to your desktop. And then there, you can simply extract it. Once you've extracted it, you can simply drag and drop it to your code editor of choice. In this case, I'll be using Visual Studio Code. Let's make this a bit bigger, increase the font size so that everybody can see it, and let's go under View, and then finally Terminal. Before starting with anything, you can open up the server-side package.json, and we're going to modify the start script to say nodemon index.js instead of node. That way, it's going to always keep our code updated. You can save and close that. And now we can split our terminal by clicking here and clicking split. Great. We can clear both sides. The left side of our terminal is going to be our client side, meaning React. So you can CD into client and then there you can run npm install. The second one is going to be for our backend or our server side. So you can CD into server and run npm install. Once both client side and server side finish installing the necessary dependencies to start our application, you can run npm start both on our client side and on our server side. This is going to initialize the application. If you've done everything correctly, you should see my demo posts here. These are some of the most visited places on earth, but of course you can connect your own database. 
The database connection with MongoDB Atlas is covered in depth in the first 20 minutes of the first Memories video. So if you want to learn in depth how to connect it, definitely make sure to check it out. Again, the link is in the description. But for now, let me also give you a quick refresher. First, you need to go to the MongoDB Atlas website, and then you have to either create your account or sign in if you already have one. Once you're in here, if you haven't already, you'll have to create a cluster. In this case, I already have my cluster running. In here, we can click Connect, and then finally, connect your application. In here, you can see a string which we have to use to connect it. Keep in mind that in here, you need to change your password and also the name of your database. So let's copy that before we go to our code. I also want to show you that you can change your password if you go to database access, then right here, click edit. And then in here, you can click edit password and change it. Once you've copied the link and once you know your password, let's go back to the code. More specifically, we're going to go to the server and then index. Inside of here, you can see that we have our connection URL. You can definitely keep using my URL and that way you'll always have some memories in there, but feel free to remove it. And then in here, make sure to paste your own URL. Of course, you have to change your password and you also have to change the name of your database. Great, with that said, we are up and running and we can start implementing the comments feature. Let's do that right away. Let's close our terminal and let's start implementing our comments section. That's going to be inside of the client folder, inside of the source, components, post details, and then inside of here, we're going to create one more component. That component is going to be called comment section.jsx. This is a new component that contains all the logic about comments. So let's import react from react. And we're also going to import a few hooks. These are going to be use state and also use ref. Right below, we're going to import everything we need from material UI. And that's going to be typography. We also need the text field. And finally, we need a button component that's coming from at material UI forward slash core. Also, we're going to use the use dispatch hook belonging to Redux. So we can say that's coming from react dash Redux. And we're also going to use some styles. So we can say import use styles and that's coming from dot slash styles. Great. Now we have the majority of imports that we have to do and let's create our component const comment section. And that's going to be equal to a functional react component inside of there. For now, let's simply console log something like comment section. And also let's simply return an H one just so we can see something on the page for now. Great. Of course, we have to do export default comment section. Of course, we have to use this comment section somewhere. And that's going to be inside of the post details when we open more details about a specific memory. So in here at the top, let's import comment section from dot slash comment section, just like this. And where are we going to render that component? Well, the last time we even left a typography saying where we need to put it comments coming soon. So let's simply delete that. And then instead of that typography, we're going to render out our comment section. It is going to be self closing component. And let's pass one prop to it. And that prop is going to be the data for the specific post we're currently on, we're going to use that inside of the comment section. So let's go back to our comment section. And let's immediately destructure our post data just so we know what's coming through there. And maybe instead of this comment section, let's simply console log the post. Great, we already have enough code that we can see it on the website. Let's open up a specific memory page. And then inside of here, you can see that we have a big comment section. Now let's create the JSX for our comments. Inside of that div, we're going to have yet another div. And this div is going to have a class name equal to 
classes dot comments outer container. Right now, our classes are not defined. And to use the classes coming from the use styles, we can simply say const classes is equal to use styles, and then we call it as a hook. Great. Now inside of this div, we're going to have yet another div. And this div is going to have a class name equal to classes dot comments inner container. Great. Now we have our layout. Now inside of our inner container, we're going to have a typography component. And that typography is going to have a prop of gutter bottom, which is simply going to give it some bottom margin, and is going to be a variant equal to h6. Now inside of there, we can simply say something like comments. Now we have to loop through the comments of our specific post. Of course, right now, none of the memories or none of the posts have the actual comments because we haven't implemented the feature of adding them yet. But let's create the JSX code that's going to loop over them once we have them populated. Let's open a dynamic JSX block. And then in here, we're going to loop over the comments. For now, let's create a use state field. So const comments and set comments. And that is going to be equal to use state. For now, in here, we can leave simply an empty array because we have no comments yet. Now that we have comments, let's loop over them. Comments.map. In here, we're going to get a comment. I'm going to put C for short. And also, we're going to get the index. Then we want to instantly return something. So don't put the curly braces here, but simply a parenthesis. Now for each specific comment, we're going to show a typography. And that typography is going to have a key equal to I. It's also going to have a gutter bottom, and it's going to have a variant equal to subtitle one. For now, we can simply say something like comment in there, or we can even make it dynamic and say comment I, this is going to give it a number. Now, just so we can see this, let's add one, two, three, four here, that should render out four demo comments, I'm going to save that. And in the browser, we can already see our comments header, and we can see comment zero, one, two, three. So we're already starting to create the layout for our comments. Later on, of course, we're going to have real comments in here. But for now, let's keep moving forward. Below the comments inner div, we're going to have one more div. And this div is not going to have classes, it's simply going to have some inline styles, we can say style is equal to width is equal to a string of 70%. Inside of there, we're going to have one more typography, we can even copy this one. Everything is going to be the same gutter bottom variant h6. And we can simply say, write a comment. Now, as we have our comments below our comments typography, we're going to have the code to write a comment below this typography. So to do that, let's create a material UI text field, which is basically just an input. It is a self closing tag, we can expand it in multiple rows. And let's give it a few properties. The first one is going to be full width. This means that the text field is going to span across the entire width of the screen. Then we're also going to have a property called rows. And we're going to set that to four. Usually text fields are simple fields for like name or last name or something like that. But our comments can be longer. And that's why we can have multiple rows. Our variant is going to be equal to outlined. And we can also have a label which is going to simply say comment. We are going to make our text field multi line. And then in there, we have to keep track of the value of our specific comment to keep track of the value of our text field, we have to create another state. So we can say const comment now singular, and then set comment is equal to use state. In there, we're going to pass an empty string because we want to start with empty string. Now that we have that we can specify a value and the value of this text field is going to be a comment. Then we can specify the on change property. And to change something, we have to get the event like this. And we have to call the set comment and more specifically event dot target 
that value. That's going to set the value of our text field. Let's save it and look at it in the browser. Okay, that's already starting to look just a bit better. We have our comments and we have our write a comment section. Of course, we still haven't implemented the styles for our containers. We're going to do that really quickly. Now let's add a button. Below our text field, I'm going to create a button. That button is going to have a few properties. First, it's going to have an inline style equal to margin top. And then in there, we can simply say 10 pixels. That's going to separate it a bit from the text field. Then it's also going to be full width. It's also going to be disabled. So we can say disabled. And it's only going to be disabled if we haven't yet typed in our comment. So we can say if no comment. Our button is also going to have a variant equal to contained. And it's going to have just one more property, which is the on click handler. What do we want to do on click? Well, we want to call a special handle click function, which we're going to create right now. But before we do that, let's simply put something in our button. And that is comment. Great. So now we can see that we're missing our handle click. Let's create it at the top. For now, we can simply leave it as a blank function. Const handle click is equal to an arrow function. Great. Now we finished the better part of our comment section. Let's implement our styles. To do that, I'm going to open up the styles.js and we have to add just a few class names. Below the loading paper, I'm going to add the comments outer container. That is going to be equal to an object. And then in there, we simply want to say display is equal to flex. And also justify content is going to be equal to space between. Below our comments outer container, we're also going to have our comments inner container. And then in there, we can simply specify the height, which is going to be equal to 200 pixels. We can also specify the overflow Y, which is going to make our div scrollable. So we can set that to auto. And we can also give it a margin right, which is going to be equal to 30 pixels. Great. These are all the styles that we need for now. So let's go back to our comment section. And let's actually check it out in the browser. That already looks so much better. Technically, we've finished the entire front end part of our comments functionality. Now is the time that we connect it to Redux and then send that data to the backend and finally create a comment in the database. So let's do that right now. Now let's grab this data from a specific comment. And when we click comment, let's submit it to Redux. Also, I've just noticed that our button is gray and it has to be blue. So let's change it right inside of here. We're going to give it a property called color, which is equal to primary. Now, if you type test, you can see it has this nice primary color. With that said, you already know that we created our handle click function, but we have no code inside of there. So let's implement the code right here. When we click comment, we have to dispatch a new action to our Redux. More specifically, we can dispatch a comment post action. Our comment also needs to contain the information about who is creating that specific comment. So let's grab our user from the local storage. I'm going to remove this console log and I'm going to grab our user. We can say const user is equal to json.parse. And then we can go inside of the local storage and simply call get item user. This is going to populate our user from the local storage. We've already done this a few times throughout our application. Now that we have the user's data, let's form our comment to include the user's name and also the comment itself. Let's say something like const final comment. And that is going to be equal to a template string. The first thing in there is going to be user dot result dot name. And then we can say colon. And then in here, we render the comment. So just one more time, we are getting the user's name here. And we're saying who wrote that comment, that user, and what is the context of the comment? Well, it is the actual state we are going to write that in that specific text field right in here. Now that we have the contents of the comment, and we can put that here, final comment, 
And also as the second parameter, we have to say which post does this comment belong to. So let's add a comma and let's say post dot underscore ID. Great. But as you can see, our dispatch is currently not here and also our comment post is not defined. So let's fix that. First, we can get the dispatch by saying const dispatch is equal to use dispatch hook. But now we have to create that action. For now, let's simply import it, even though it's not yet created, we can say import comment post, and that's going to be imported from dot dot slash dot dot slash actions forward slash posts. Great. Now let's create it right inside of there. We are going to go to actions and then posts. And right inside of here, below the like post, we're going to implement the comment post. So let's follow the same structure, export const comment post. And in this case, we'll be getting two different parameters. The first one is the value. And the second one is the ID of the post. Then considering that data is asynchronous, we have to use Redux thunk, and it has this weird structure, which is the async dispatch. And then after that, one more function call like that. Now, how can you know that we are getting the value and the ID? Well, we can know that because in here, that's exactly what we're passing the comment, including the name and the comment and the ID. Great. So let's create the actual comment post action. We're going to create a try and catch block as we always do. Now we have to make an API call and that's going to look something like this, await API dot comment. And then in there, we're going to pass the value and the ID. Of course, we don't yet have that API comment as we have the like post or delete post or all other. So we have to create that. And let's do that right away. Let's go to our API and then index.js. Inside of here, we can even copy the entire like post just above. Now let's change it. We're going to change this to comment. Our comment accepts two different parameters, and that is the value and the ID. The method of the request is going to be the post because we want to create a comment and the route is going to be forward slash posts forward slash ID and then forward slash comment post. But of course, we also have to pass some value with it. So just next to that, we're going to pass an object that's going to contain the value of our comment. Great. We're now ready to make API calls from the front end to the back end. But this route doesn't yet exist in our backend, so let's create it right away. To start creating our backend, let's first close all of our tabs just so we have a cleaner workspace. And let's collapse our files and folders. Now let's go to our server, and then we're going to go to routes posts.js. We can duplicate our like post route, and in here it's going to be incredibly similar, but just a bit different. Instead of the patch request, it is going to be a post request. And instead of the like post, it's going to be comment post we need to be logged in to be able to comment the post. So we're going to leave this here. And then also, we're going to change this to comment post. Of course, we have to first create that controller. And let's import it right there, comment post. This here is going to be a function on the backend that's going to handle the creation of the comment. So let's go to our controllers and our posts.js. Now let's scroll all the way down below our like post and let's create a new controller that's going to handle the post creation. It's going to look something like this, export const comment post, and that is going to be an async function. It's going to accept the request and the response as all of the controllers do. And in there, we want to get a few values from our front end. First, we're going to get the ID of the post by saying const, and then we can destructure the ID from rec.params. And then also, we're going to get const destructure the value, but this time it's going to be coming from rec.body. Now, let me specify how is that working. I'm going to open the client source API index.js and put it on the side. The request params is something coming through here. Take a look we have this ID right there. 
And if you take a look at our routes, you can see that the ID coming in is dynamic. And that's what populates the ID right here in the rec params. So where does this value from the rec.body come from? Well, if you take a look at our request one more time, you can see that we're passing that object that contains the value. And that's what's populating this value. That's basically the value of our comment. Great. Now let's use those values to create a comment in the database. First, we have to fetch the post that we have to put our comment on. So we can say const post is equal to await post message dot find by ID. And then in there, we can simply pass that ID. Finally, we're going to go into our post into the comments of our post, and we're simply going to push the contents of our comment that is going to update our post, but we have to actually update it in the database as well. So let's say const updated post is equal to await post message dot find by ID and update. And then inside of there, we have to pass the ID, we have to pass the new post, and we have to pass the options object that's going to contain the message new is equal to true. I know this is a long line, so let me repeat it one more time. We are getting the post from the database, we're adding the comments to that post, and then we are updating the database so that the new post contains that new comment. Finally, we are storing the value of that post in our updated post variable. Once we have that, we can simply return res.json, that updated post, and we can receive that back on the front end. Great, but there is one more thing we also have to update the model of our post. So we can go to our server and then models and then our post message. Inside of here, just below the likes, we can create the comments part and we can say the type of the comments is going to be an array of strings and the default value is going to be an empty array because by default, we don't have any comments in. Great, now we can come back to our front end Let's first close all of this, go to client side, source, and then actions, posts. Inside of here, now we know that we are receiving something back once we actually call this API. So let's retrieve that value. We can do that by saying const response is equal to this. And then in here, we can destructure and simply take the data from that response. For now, we can simply console log that data. So what are we expecting to see with this console log? Well, if our database functionality for creating the comment works, and if our frontend is sending the correct data in the first place, that means that this data should return a new post, and that post should have the comments that are gonna be an array, and it should have a new comment that we type in. So now let's test it out. I'm right here on a specific memory page. I'm gonna click inspect, and then I'm gonna open the console. Now we'll keep track of our console and we'll see if our comment gets there. Let's write something like test and click comment. Okay, something is read and looks like we have the result of null. That means that the user hasn't been fetched yet or we haven't properly been logged in. So let's close this, reload, and yeah, it's true. We are not logged in and we cannot post comments if you're not. So we have to properly handle that error. Let's go back and then inside of here, we're gonna check if we have a user. So how are we gonna solve this? Well, there are a few ways. First of all, we can in here, once the user clicks, we can then check if the user is logged in and then if he's not, we can disable that. But there's a better way. Why would the user even need to see the part for creating the post if that's gonna result in failure? Let's immediately remove this from his view that way, he's not gonna run into errors. So right inside of here, we can take this, we can check if there's a user, we can do that by simply putting our code here, opening a dynamic block, and we're gonna check if there is a user dot result dot name, then we're going to show this. So we can say end end, and then open a parenthesis. Then at the end of our div, we can close that parenthesis and close our dynamic block. This code is basically saying, if the user has a name, basically meaning if there is a user, then display this piece of code, otherwise show nothing. Our user is sometimes going to be undefined, 
and we cannot do the dot notation with undefined. It's not possible to do undefined dot result dot name. So we have to handle that. I'm going to bring the user back and I'm going to say user question mark dot result and then question mark dot name. This is the new JavaScript syntax that's going to allow us to simply not throw an error if the user doesn't exist. Let's save it and check it out in the browser. And would you look at that? Now we have only our comments, but since our user is not logged in, he cannot create any. That's great. He can view, but not create. Now let's sign in. I'm going to sign in with Google. And apparently, even if I'm logged in, I cannot see the post creation part. So let's see what that is about. I'm going to console log our user just at the top right here. And our user seems to be null. And looks like I've made a small mistake. Instead of specifying user here, we should be specifying profile. I'm going to copy this and search for this across the entire code base. As you can see, we've been calling profile many times and never user. I just made a typo. So let's go back to our comment section and see if this works right now. We can even remove this console log because I'm quite certain it will work. And since we're logged in, we should be able to see the part where we can create a comment. And there we go. Now we can see this part where we can write a comment. If we were logged out, we wouldn't be able to see it. But now let's see if this comment is going to come through. I'm going to say test and click comment. Now we're expecting a console log with the post now including the comment. And there it is. Considering that I've used this before, it's going to have a few more comments. Yours should have just a few. But there it is. Our comments are there. Now we have to fetch them and using Redux and reducers, we have to bring them back into our JSX view. And we can do that like this. Let's go back to our actions where we left off. That's going to be actions post.js. And then inside of here, we're getting the data about a specific post now including the comments. So the question is, what do we do with it? Well, we're going to simply dispatch a new action. We can say dispatch. And we're going to specify the type of our action to be equal to comment. Also, we're going to specify the payload to be that new post with now included comment. Also, after we dispatch that specific comment, we're also going to return the data.comments. That means that we're returning the newest comment that's coming in. And inside of here, inside of the catch, we can simply console log the error. One more thing. See how we've used the constants for all of our action types right there, start loading and loading and so on. Let's now create the constant for the comment as well. So right here next to the like, I'm going to create a new constant and that's going to be comment. Of course, this is just the import. We have to create that constant right here under the source and then constants action types. Just below like, I'm going to create the comment. And that's basically just a string. Again, if you're not sure why we're using this for, maybe watch some of the previous videos. But the quick explanation is that if you scroll down here, if you write something like comment here and maybe miss one letter like this, comment, that's going to cause a lot of problems in your app, but it's not going to throw an error. So you might be able to miss it. But like this, if we write it as a constant, then if you miss just one letter, it's immediately going to throw you an error. That's the reason why we do it. That part is now done. The last part we have to do is deal with this data in our Redux and then send our comments back to our comment section where we'll be able to fetch them and then loop over the real comments, not just the dummy data. So let's do that right away. To get this data to our component, there's one last step of the entire Redux workflow that we have to do. First, we're dispatching an action. Then inside of that action creator, we are making an API call. And finally, we have to go to our reducers. So let's go to reducers and then posts.js. Now inside of our reducers, we also need to pull our comment action type. And we have to add one more case. To create a new case, let's go under our like right there. And let's say case comment. So what are we going to do on the comment? Well, we're also going to return an object. So let's specify it like this. And in every object, we want to first spread the state. And we're going to do that here as well. Once we spread the state, we want to define posts. So we can say posts is equal to 
state.posts.map. So we want to map over all of the posts and we're going to get each individual post. Then we want to do something. So what do we want to do here? Well, we want to return all the other posts normally. I'm going to explain quickly what do I mean by that. And then we want to change the post that just received a comment. Great. So we want to return all the posts normally and then change only the post that recently received a comment. How can we do that? Well, we can check if post dot underscore ID and if that is equal to action dot payload dot underscore ID. That is our new post that just received a comment. So if that's the case, then we want to return only that new specific post, which is equal to action dot payload. And in other case, we simply want to return a post. One more time, return all the other posts normally like this. And then if the post is that specific post that just received a comment, then return it changed with that comment included. Great. So this is how this works. We can now remove these comments, put this in one line. And that is it. This is how our common functionality in Redux works. I know it might be a bit confusing. We're spreading the state and then setting the posts. But keep in mind, we want to return all of the posts and only change the one that just received a comment. That is it. Great. So with that, we're done with the reducers. And now we can actually take a look at our data inside of our comment section component. So let's do just that. I'm going to close all of our other files, go inside of here. And now we want to fetch our comments. The comments are of course stored in a post and we are already getting a post right there. So what we can do is we can initially set our comments to be the comments of that specific post. So right in here, I'm going to say post question mark dot comments. Okay, so now we're getting our Redux data from the backend right in here and putting it in our comments. And of course, we have to change it right there. So we're not going to simply say comment I, we are going to return the C, the comment, of course. So for every comment, we want to return a comment inside of a typography. Let's save it and check it out. And would you look at that? We have our comments. I've been there last year, the best experience ever. And we have all of the comments that we can scroll through and read them. Now let's sign in as well. Okay, as we're signed in, we can now write a comment and the functionality should be fully functional. So let's say great memory. Okay, let's try saying great memory a few times. And nothing seems to be happening. But if you reload the page, you'll be able to see that we clicked it quite a few times. So we just have to make it update immediately as soon as we leave the comment. And that's what we'll do right now. But with that said, you can see the comments actually work, you can write a comment, click comment right there, and you just left it on this specific memory. Let's go to another one. Let's go for example, to the Eiffel Tower. Let's write something meaningful. Looks great at night. Great. And let's comment it. And as you can see, nothing happened right away. But if we reload, the comment should actually be there. And there it is. Okay, so now let's make it update automatically. We can do that by immediately receiving all the new comments from the dispatched action. If I go into this specific action creator, you can notice that we are returning all the new comments, and we can actually make use of that. Let's make this function asynchronous. And right inside of here, we can say const new comments, and new comments are going to be equal to await dispatch. Great. So now we can use those comments more specifically to set the comments to new comments. That's going to update our state of comments and then render them down immediately. What we can also do is we can set our singular comment that's the data inside of the text field, we can set that to be an empty string, and that should clear it out. So let's check it out. Anybody else been here? Let's do something like that, leave a comment, and take a look. Amazing, we can successfully post comments on our memories. Now, what if I keep adding comments like test, and then maybe one more, let's add test one. As you can see, test one has been added, but you cannot automatically see it, which is not a great user experience, you have to scroll down. 
So let's make it scroll automatically. You might think that you're gonna have to use some external libraries or that it's gonna be hard to do it, but it's not really that hard. We just have to know how to use refs. So we're importing the use ref hook right there. And right here, we can see const comments ref is going to be equal to use ref. So we've just created this specific reference that we're going to hook onto a specific element. More specifically, we are going to create an empty div just below all of our messages. So right here, we can create a self closing div like this. And the only thing it's going to have is going to be a ref equal to comments ref. This is going to be our anchor point. We're always going to scroll to this specific div because we know that that div is at the end of all of our messages. So let's scroll up. When do we want to scroll? Well, we want to scroll once we add a new comment. So right here, let's create the functionality to scroll down. We can do that by saying comments ref dot current dot scroll into view. I'm missing an N here. And you call that as a function, pass in an object. And then in here, we can say behavior is equal to smooth. That's going to make it scroll slowly to that specific point. And with that, our scroll should be done. Let's check it out. Let's add a new comment. Let's do test two. And as you can see, it just scrolled. Let's try adding a few more. Test four. It scrolled as well. Great. This functionality is now done. Last thing that we can do is make the username bold and leave this as it is. We can do that right inside of here by splitting our comment into two parts. More specifically, we can say comment.split and we want to split it by that colon and we want to get the username. So if we do zero, this here is only the username. Now that we have just the username, we can put that into a strong tag and that is going to make the text bold. So if I do it like this and just below, we can now get the second part, which is the actual comment. So we can say C dot split. We want to again split by the same thing. And in here, we want to get the first part, which is the actual comment on the bottom part. Make sure not to put the space in here. Great. Let's save it and check it out. Great. That works. Now we can differentiate the username from the comment. This is a seemingly easy feature that we just implemented, but it's really going to add a lot to the entire application. Our memories project really needed the comment section because now people can comment on each other's memories and share their stories. But that's not it for this video. I've decided to do one more thing. Some of you guys requested of me in the comments, and that is to fix the speed of liking something. Right now, if you click like, it's going to take maybe a second, a second and a half, or maybe four to five seconds in areas with slower internet connection. So if I click it, notice how long is it going to take? Yep, that was quite a long pause. So what we're going to implement for the end of this video is the ability to immediately give the user feedback once he likes something. The actual liking on the backend is going to take two to three seconds, but we can immediately display the action to the user. Let's do that. And this is not useful only for liking. You can use this technique with everything where you want to give users the quick user feedback. If you appreciate these little tips that I like giving to you, definitely make sure to like and comment down below. Comment if you'd like to see the entire map of all the memories implemented in the next video. To implement our, let's call it quick liking, we can go to client source components, and we're going to go to posts and finally a singular post component. From here, we can see that we have some imports that we are not using. So we can delete that right here, get posts. And we can also immediately import use state from react because we'll definitely be using that. Great. So now let's see what do we have to do. Right now, we're getting the post passed through props. And that's fine. We're then using that post to find out the length of the likes in that specific likes array. And then based on that, we're showing our likes. But we can make that just a bit better. First of all, we're going to implement a new state field called likes. 
And of course, it's going to have a set likes, which is going to be equal to use state. And then inside of there, we want to immediately set that to the post question mark dot likes. So we're taking the same value from our post right there, post question mark dot likes, and we're setting that into likes. So, so far, not a lot has changed. But there is a specific reason why we need to do that. Because now we can set them again, we can reset them, we can change them because now we have this setter function. So we're going to scroll down and find where we're actually liking something. Here's the delete. And right here is the like button. So right now we are doing something on click, but we need to do a bit more stuff. So I'm going to copy this and simply create a new function called handle click. We're going to use that function above right inside of here. So right here, let's create a new function const handle like is equal to an async function like this. And then let's simply paste what we had. Of course, we don't need this callback function. It says our handle like is not being used. So let me see why I called it handle click, a more appropriate name would be handle like. Great. So now we've changed nothing, we've added a new handler function, which is still doing the same thing it used to do before. And we also just added these likes, which again is not being used. So now what can we do to start using them? Inside of here, we're gonna add an if check, I'm going to copy this entire part right there, post likes that find and then we're checking if the like is equal to to the Google ID or the result underscore ID. We're basically checking in this whole thing, did the current user like the post? So we can say if this, and that's basically saying, did the current user like the post or not? Usually when you have lines as long as this one, it's good to put them to a specific variable. So let's say const has liked post. And that is going to be equal to this. Now that we have this, we know that that's going to be a Boolean value. And we can say if has liked the post, then we want to do something else. If the user hasn't liked the post, then we want to do something else. So what do we want to do if the current user has liked the post? Well, we want to set the likes to be equal to post dot likes dot filter. Inside of here, we get a specific ID. And we want to filter out the ID of that specific person. So we can say if ID is not equal to, and that's going to be in parentheses, user question mark dot result dot result dot Google ID. Or we can also have user question mark dot result question mark dot underscore ID. So we're basically simply filtering out the like because if the user has liked the post and he or she clicks the button again, that means that they want to unlike it. But now I figured out we're mentioning this part quite often. So I want to take that entire part and put it in a new variable. Let's copy it. And I'm going to call it something like const user ID. And that's going to be equal to all of this, we no longer have to repeat it, I'm going to put it above. And we can use that ID in a few places. We can use it right here, because you can notice is the same thing. We can also use it right here. That's also the same thing. And we can also use it right here, because it's the same thing. This was a great little lesson where we use two new variables to simplify our code and make it more readable. Now everybody can understand that this whole part is either getting the user's ID from Google, or a normal ID from the database, and it's storing it in the user ID variable. And then in here, we're simply figuring out if the user has currently liked a post or not. Finally, if the user has liked the post, that means that they want to unlike it, and then we filter out their specific like. But if the situation is different, if they haven't liked it, we can say set likes equal to, we spread all of the current likes, and then we want to add one new one. And that is that same user ID variable we created right here. And why is this faster than simply updating the database immediately? Because updates to the database are asynchronous and they take time, but this is going to happen instantly. Finally, we need to use our likes, as you can see, they're not currently being used right here. 
we have to exchange every single place where we mention post that likes and simply use our likes. So that's happening here. You can do control F and then find post that likes and simply replace that with likes. Then you can click enter a few times and it's going to fill that for you. There we go. So in all of the places where we use post that likes, you simply have to switch it to simply likes. There might have been a lot of code in here. So if you mess something up, that's completely fine. You already know where the link to the entire GitHub repository is. So make sure to copy the file if it's not working for you. Okay, before we finally take a look in the browser, I think we also have to replace this part here with only likes and let's check it out. Okay, let me try to like something. That was instantaneous. Take a look at that. I can like and unlike all the posts incredibly quickly. And if I refresh the page, as you can see, it's going to be updated in the database. I can try unliking everything now. And then we're going to reload the page. And as you can see, everything was successfully stored in the database. But now the feedback that the user receives is instantaneous. Look at that. I would say it's less than 100 milliseconds. It's basically instantaneous. Great. That was it for this video. We've sped up our like and we've added the comments, which was a great feature that was really needed in this memories application. If you liked the video, make sure to leave a like, comment down below, turn on the bell notifications, and thank you so much for watching and supporting JavaScript Mastery. I'm gonna have some extremely cool updates for you guys really soon. So if you want to stay up to date, the link to join the mailing list is going to be down in the description definitely make sure to do that. With that said, one more time, thank you so much for watching and see you in the next one.